Welcome everyone and thank you very much for joining me this evening. Tonight I'm going to be reviewing our four key areas of health, how lockdown has negatively affected them and most importantly how we can reverse these negative effects to make a fresh start for spring to get us feeling better than ever. Now I've got so much information for you in these slides I am going to be cant cantering through them really quite quickly so I apologize in advance that I am going quite quickly but I just got so much information to share with you that I want to give you this evening. All right, let me get my uh, screen share going. Let's get my presentation up for you. Oops. Sorry, we'll just sorry about that. Okay. So the four key areas of health that we're going to look at today, we're going to look at stress, and we're going to I'm going to talk you through how our body responds to stress. We're gonna understand our sleep cycle and what aspects can disturb our sleep. We're gonna look at all the benefits of exercise and what types of exercise we should be doing and how much exercise we should be doing. And the fourth area, key area of health that we're gonna look at is our nutrition. And we're gonna look at foods that can harm us and foods that heal us. And we're gonna talk about what a properly balanced diet is. And then once we get a really good understanding of those four key areas of health, then I'm gonna share with you, I'm gonna get into the juicy stuff. I'm gonna share with you with my top tips on how to step out of lockdown, reduce our stress, encourage sleep, incorporate exercise and use food to support our health. Now, once I've given you all those tips, it's no good having those tips if you don't know how to incorporate into that, them into your daily lives. So I've got some bonus slides about how to form healthy habits. And then at the end, with your permission, I'd just like to take just a couple of minutes to tell you, talk to you about what nutritional therapy is and how it can support you reach your health goals. So now before we go into those four key areas of health, let's just have a look at how lockdown has negatively affected us. So with stress, it's definitely affected our careers and our jobs. It's most definitely affected our financial situation. And it's also affected us emotionally and mentally as well as we've not been able to be with our loved ones and our friends and family. And we've really had that really strong sense of isolation through lockdown. So our stress levels have encountered something that we've never really been through before. Our sleep has also been disrupted. We've probably been a lot less active maybe as we've been indoors so much, so maybe we're not as tired. Um, the stress has probably been keeping us up at night and worrying and anxiety as well over what's gonna happen in our futures. That's probably been keeping us up. Loneliness itself can keep us up at night. And of course, if we've been ill as well, that's gonna affect our sleep patterns as well and can disrupt them as well. We can look at exercise. Now, I know myself at the beginning of uh, March, 2020, when we went into lockdown, we thought, great, we don't have to go to work. We can start a new exercise routine, new excuses now. We can really get going with exercise. And over the year, I'm sure that like myself, it has waned off quite a bit, um, especially since the gyms have closed. Um, we've had a lot less classes available to us, although Total Therapy Studios has still been doing online classes. So that's been really good. Um, however, across the board, we've kind of lost that group dynamic a little bit, haven't we? We've lost our exercise buddies, our routines have been disrupted. And although we could exercise in the weather in 2020, in the second lockdown in 2021, that poor weather, that rain and wind and all that mud sure didn't motivate me to go outside and exercise. And also if we've had a lot of stress and our sleep has been disrupted, we may not feel motivated to exercise as well. And that could have impact, negatively impacted our exercise as well. And lastly, with nutrition, never before in the histories of, of our lives have we been living so close to our refrigerators and our kitchen cupboards. And so I know that's led a lot of us to a lot of comfort eating in these uncertain times, eating out of boredom when there's nothing to do indoors. Um, I'm sure a lot of us have increased our alcohol consumption and we've been making poor food choices, especially if our finances have been um, under constraint. And again, if we are stressed or we haven't been sleeping, then we want those quick comfort foods again. And if we've been sick, we don't want to spend hours in the kitchen. We just, you know, we just want quick and easy foods. And that, so that's affected our nutrition as well. And when we have reduced wellness in any one, any one or all four of these areas, that's going to reduce our mental stress or mental health. And we're going to end up in this negative vicious cycle of uh, one area affects the other area when we have this domino effect. And now that we're coming out of lockdown, what we really want to do is start reversing that and get that more into a positive mode again. So before we talk about how we get that into the positive effects, what I just want you to do, uh, what I want to do is share with you a really good understanding of these four key areas of health. And then we're going to look at how we reverse that cycle. So first we're going to look at stress. 
So our stress response is how we um, respond to danger. So it's called our fight or flight. We fight danger or run away from danger. And that stress response has not changed in thousands of years. Our stress response does not know the difference between whether or not we are running from a saber toothed tiger or whether we have a really bad deadline at work or we've just got a really, um, a really bad email from our boss. Our body responds exactly the same way as it did thousands of years ago. And how it responds is um, and cortisol, which is our stress hormone, floods our body. Cortisol tells sugar to be released and flood our, our blood system full of sugar so that we've got instant energy so we can either fight off danger or run away from danger. Our heart rate increases, our blood pressure increases. We even get increased clotting factors because if we get injured during this fight or flight, we don't wanna bleed to death while we're trying to run away. So we get a lot more clotting factors in our blood as well our muscles tense, our breathing becomes really rapid and shallow, our pupils dilated. And that's how our body um, responds to stress in order to deal with the immediate stress at hand. Now, any action or system in the body that is not immediately required for survival is impaired. So our immune system is dialed down. We don't need to worry, be, worry, be worrying about any germs that may have got into our mouth right now. We're in survival mode. Our digestion is slowed down. Forget about that sandwich. Again, we've got a saber-toothed tiger following us. So our saliva flow decreases, our stomach acid decreases, and our entire digestive system just slows right down. And the same with our reproduction. We don't need to be worrying right now. We're in a, a survival state. We don't need to be worrying about making healthy sperm or healthy eggs or falling pregnant. So um, all of these systems get impaired. Um, now, there are certain different things that can trigger cortisol into a system. So we do have the stresses that we know of, um, but there's also physical trauma can flood our body with cortisol. Extreme heat or cold could also um, trigger cortisol to be released. And for somebody that's um, um, quite responsive to stress, even getting out of a hot shower and going into a cold bathroom, you know, when we've got the window open the, in the winter, that hot shower to cold bathroom, that alone could be enough to trigger a cortisol release and trigger that res stress response in some people. And exhaustive exercise as well. That is a form of physical stress on our body. And because of that physical stress, that too can also release cortisol into our body. Now this fight or flight response is meant to be short term, just enough to get us out of danger. But our modern day stresses, um, we haven't adapted to these modern day stresses. And so what happens then when we have long-term stresses is we end up in this state of chronic stress. And I just wanna walk you through the, the stages of chronic stress. So stage one, that yellow, that alarm stage, that's when stress comes up. That's when the boss says, right, I need this project done and it's gotta be done in six weeks. And so that's when our stress levels go up. But then of course our stress doesn't go back down, does it? For six weeks or whatever, however length of time, we are still under stress. So our cortisol levels have to stay elevated and we enter stage two, which is called the resistance stage. And that's when we are, we're under stress. We know we're under stress, but that's okay. We can handle it. You know, we're, we're grooving, life, life is stressful. We're good. We, we've got, we're on top of it. And how long we're in that resistance stage is gonna depend on either how long that stress is around for, or if it's a really long chronic stress, maybe we're in that stage for a month, maybe we're in it for a year, it depends on the individual. And some signs and symptoms that you're in that resistance phase is when you notice that you're starting to get really irritable all the time, and when you're getting frustrated quite easily, and when you can't quite focus on one task at a time, that's when you know you're in the resistance phase. Now, when we're in that resistance phase, the cortisol levels stay elevated throughout that entire phase. Now, we need the ingredients to make cortisol, and so our body is using up things like cholesterol and vitamin C, those key ingredients that we need to make cholesterol. But eventually, over time, we're going to start running out of those ingredients ingredients. And those ingredients are going to get shorter and shorter supply. And so we're going to enter phase three, which is the exhausted stage. And that's when we start getting tired and depression and anxiety starts setting in and we can no longer tolerate stress. You know, that's when your shoe breaks and you, you feel like your whole day is ruined. And then eventually we use all, all of our body's resources and we end up having burnout or breakdown. And so that is what happens to us during chronic stress. Now, how that chronic stress impacts us, it's got a lot of negative impacts on us because we're not designed to be in this state of chronic stress. So first of all, it can lead to weight gain. And that's because, do you remember I said that cortisol tells the body to, to be flooded, flood our blood system with sugar so that we can fight or flight. Now, if we don't use that sugar, if we're just sitting at our desk, we cannot keep sugar elevated in our blood. We have to keep it at a certain level at all times. 
So our pancreas stimulates insulin to sweep that extra sugar back under the rug. And under the rug means around our belly and around our organs. And that's an unhealthy place to carry, to store our sugar and store our fat, because then that can lead us to an increased risk of type two diabetes. Also that sugar is really sticky and damaging in our blood and that can damage the lining of our arteries. And because it's sticky, proteins and cholesterols will stick to each other and then that sticks to the inside of our arteries. So it leads us to an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. And remember, we've got all those clotting factors floating around in us as well. So that's gonna increase our risk as well of cardiovascular disease. And because our immune system has been dampened down, it's making us more susceptible to illness and it's gonna take us a lot longer to recover from illness. And we're gonna get a lot of digestive issues as well. And that's because everything is slowing down in our digestive system. And when that slows down, it means that our food is not digesting properly and our food is sitting in our digestive system for a lot longer than it's supposed to. So our food literally starts putrefying in our guts. Sorry to be so graphic. Um, but then that causes gas and bloating and cramping and all those irritable bowel syndrome uh, symptoms that we can see quite commonly nowadays. Now, the other thing that gets impaired, so our microbiome gets impaired as well. So it means we end up getting more bad bacteria than good bacteria, and that's gonna affect digestion. And that imbalance in bacteria also affects our serotonin production. So serotonin is our feel-good hormone. And now we normally associate that with being made in the brain, which it is, but most of our serotonin is actually made in our gut. So that's gonna be decreased as well. The other thing with hormones that happens in our gut is that now when we're done with estrogen, it goes through our digestive system to be expelled. If our digestive system is going slower, then that estrogen that's sitting in our digestive system is, has a higher risk of being recirculated, put into circulation again, and that's going to end up in an estrogen dominance stage or um, you know, just imbalance our hormones in general. And that is also then going to lead to fertility issues as well because our hormones are, um, are being imbalanced. Now, remember I said that cortisol will literally steal any other ingredients that it needs from the rest of the body because it's our survival hormone, it takes priority. One of the key ingredients to make cortisol is cholesterol and cholesterol is also needed to make our sex hormones, our progesterone, estrogen and testosterone. So that's gonna lead to hormone balances and fertility issues as well. Now, because cortisol is also part of our sleep-wake cycle, which we're gonna come on to in sleep, it's gonna disrupt our sleep and could lead to insomnia. It's gonna lower our mood as well because um, our the activity in our brain is gonna slow down um, and it's gonna affect our memory. And again, that serotonin levels and our dopamine levels are gonna be decreased as well because they're not needed for survival. Okay, right, let's move on to sleep. So our circadian rhythm, that is our natural sleep-wake cycle that we go through on a 24-hour clock. Um, it's controlled by the hypothalamus in our brain and it is also really affected by light and darkness as well. So cortisol, it's the same cortisol that is our stress hormone, wakes us up in the morning. It peaks about 30 to 60 minutes after we wake up. Then it dips down a little bit, but it stays elevated throughout the day. And then as the day wears on and the light goes down, our cortisol levels lower. And that lowering of the cortisol triggers our melatonin levels to rise. And then that makes us start feeling sleepy and puts us to sleep. So our circadian rhythm is really important for getting our sleep in, um, in a healthy cycle, but it also looks after quite a few other key areas as well. That's just written on the side there. So the circadian rhythm tells us when we should be feeding and fasting, when we should be active, when we should be quiet, when, how our mood should be, what our body temperature should be. So our circadian rhythm can really, if that's off balance, that can really affect different areas of our life as well. So now we all need, know we need to get good sleep, but what is good sleep? So we need to start feeling sleepy before bedtime. And that's as our melatonin levels rise with our circadian rhythm. We need to be able to fall asleep easily. We need to be able to have a restful sleep. So not tossing and turning, covers on, covers off, bad dreams, getting up three times to, to, to go to the bathroom in the night. We wanna have a deep, restful, restorative sleep. If we do wake up in the night, you know, if we come into a, a light REM, rapid eye movement, light stage sleep, sometimes we can wake up, but we should be able to fall asleep again quite quickly. And because we've had a restful sleep, we should wake up feeling refreshed in the morning. And we should have had restful sleep for seven and a half to nine hours of sleep too. So that's not seven and a half to nine hours in bed, that's actual sleep time. And we should have consistent bedtimes and wake up times to ensure that the circadian rhythm is really in balance. Now that's all lovely if we have that going on, but there's so many things out here can, that can disturb sleep. 
So disturbed sleep, we can put into two categories, things that stop us from falling asleep, or maybe we can fall asleep okay, but then things wake us up at 3 a.m. and boom, we're wide awake and we can't fall back asleep again. So let's talk about some things that can disrupt our sleep. So lack of nutrients to aid sleep. So just like we need those key ingredients to make cortisol, we also need the key ingredients to make melatonin, our sleep hormone. And we're gonna come on to that in a little bit. The most common things to stop us from falling asleep though is hyper arousal. And we, I think we're all familiar with that. That's when our brain just does not shut off and we cannot fall asleep. And a lot of times that is just due to elevated cortisol levels. So caffeine um, can, um, we all know caffeine is a stimulant and how it stimulates us is it stimulates the release of cortisol. And then once cortisol is still elevated, then that stops melatonin from rising and we won't sleep. Now, the thing about caffeine that I think a lot of people don't realize is it takes your liver a long time to clear out the caffeine out of your system. It can take seven to nine hours to clear out caffeine uh, and like coffee and that out of your system. So that's why a lot of people can't actually have coffee after midday because it'll affect their sleep because it takes so long to clear it out. Of course, stress or anxiety, again, that's your raised cortisol levels. Irregular, if your circadian rhythm is off balance, so let's say your cortisol levels don't start coming down until one or two o'clock in the morning. So of course you can't fall asleep at 10. Blood sugar imbalance, that can really affect your sleep as well. So let's say you have a really big um, white pasta dinner, um, spaghetti bolognese or something like that. Now carbohydrates are actually just a form of sugar and especially white carbohydrates like white pasta, that will actually spike your blood sugar. You can get a blood sugar high from that. And when we have too much sugar in our system, that's gonna keep us awake. So what you eat in your evening meal and how close you eat your evening meal to your bedtime can actually affect your, 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 able, your ability to fall asleep. Certain medications can also stop you falling asleep. And these are common medications too. Things like heart medications, like statins, antidepressants, allergy medications, corticosteroids, and ironically, muscle relaxants can also stop us from falling asleep. Overburden. So now that is when our body has things that it needs to deal with, but it doesn't need to deal with it during the day, it stores it for nighttime to deal with. So that's things like toxins, maybe molds that you breathed in, food intolerances, um, medications, things like that. It sort of saves it for nighttime to really deal with that. But if our body is overburdened with so many things to deal with, it can be so actively trying to deal with all those things at night that it can stop us from falling asleep. So now let's say you can fall asleep easily, but you wake up in the middle of the night. Let's talk about things that wake us up at night. So alcohol, alcohol is a big one. So if we've enjoyed a couple of glasses of wine in the evening, alcohol is a depressant, so it will help you fall asleep easier. But because it is a toxin, it is a poison to our system. It has to go through our liver in order to be shunted out. And our liver is most active between 1 a.m. and 3 a.m. So if you've had a couple of glasses of wine in the evening and you find that you tend to wake up between 1 and 3 a.m., it could be that your liver is overburdened and it's being really active. Temperature is another thing that wakes us up. Again, covers on, covers off, too hot, too cold. Um, any of us that have gone through menopause know that hot flashes, that can wake us up as well. Again, your irregular circadian rhythm. So your melatonin may rise at 10, but then that cortisol level, instead of rising at 6 a.m., is rising at 4 a.m. So if that's out of balance, that's can, that could keep you up when you wake up as well. Um, stress or anxiety. Again, if you're in a light state of sleep or if you're dreaming about something stressful, that can trigger a uh, rise in cortisol levels and keep you and wake you up. Now, blood sugar balance again. So remember that heavy pasta meal you had that spiked your blood sugar. Well, again, we can't have high sugar levels in our blood. We've got to quickly use insulin to get rid of that, all of that sugar and we end up in a sugar crash. Now, because it's so important that our blood sugar levels stay balanced, that sugar crash stimulates the survival technique and that sugar crash can actually wake you up. If you think you suffer from that, either have your evening meal a little bit further away from your bedtime or even an oat cake with a bit of peanut butter on that because you've got a bit of protein there and it can help slow release and can help balance the blood sugar levels a little bit better as well. And again, of course, medications and overburden can affect our sleep as well and wake us up. Now, the things that are in italics there, they are in, I've italicized them because they're in both categories. So if you're the type of person that has trouble falling asleep and you wake up in the night, it could be one of these things that affects both areas there. Okay, right, let's move on to exercise. 
So we know that there's many benefits of exercise. I don't need to tell you guys the benefits of exercise. But the reason I have this slide in here is because now I just wrote down as many um, benefits to exercise as I can think of. I basically just filled the screen with benefits. So I'm sure there's more than this. But I came up with 20 quite easily. The reason I wanted to put all these on the slide for you is because a lot of times we only remember one or two reasons that exercise is good for us. I mean, how many of us are guilty for exercising just because we want to lose weight and we forget about all the other benefits that are there? So what I wanted to do was put all the benefits right in front of your face to remind you that if you don't feel like doing 20 minutes of exercise, when you do, you can now remember that when you do these exercise, 20 minutes of exercise will give you 20 benefits and you get all 20 benefits every time you exercise. So that's a really good motivator to know that it's not just weight loss that you're exercising for, it's so many other things. So now we know we need to exercise, but now the confusing bit is what type of exercise do we do? How much do we need to do to get all the benefits? So let's go through that a little bit. So I like to advocate that uh, the best kind of exercise for you to do is the kind that is enjoyable to you, that keeps you interested and that you can do regularly. Okay, as long as you are exercising regularly, you will be getting health benefits. And I think that is more important than specifically what type of exercise you do. So for example, I've got friends that run, that do running and they go running quite regularly. Personally, I couldn't think of anything worse than going for a run. I hate running, but I really like lifting weights. So running doesn't work for me, but I found an exercise that works for me that I know I will stick to regularly. So now how much exercise do you need to do? I think this pyramid here on the screen is a really good example of how much exercise that we should be doing. So at the bottom there, we've got our everyday movement. That's our 10,000 steps. That's our park your car away from the shop a little bit further and walk. That's our take the stairs instead of the lift. That's our movement. As human beings, we need to move. But on top of that, we need to exercise our heart. So, so three to five days a week, we should be really working on our, our cardiovascular system. So we wanna be doing our cycling, our swimming, maybe some sports. Then two to three times a week, we need to be working on our muscles, whether that's strength training, flexibility, balance, yogas, things like that. And then of course, as little as possible, we wanna be stationary because we're not designed to be stationary creatures. Okay, right, moving on to nutrition. So why do we eat? I think most people here would answer either because we're hungry or because we need calories. And it's not, and we do need calories to make energy. However, the most important reason that we eat is for nutrients. It is nutrients within our food that keeps the functioning of our body, of each system in our body functioning properly. And when we don't get enough nutrients, that's when we start getting imbalances in our body and we start showing signs and symptoms that something's not right in our body. And when we get really deficient in these nutrients, that's when diseases um, come into play. So we all know vitamin C deficiency causes scurvy. Vitamin D deficiency causes rickets. Lack of calcium leads to osteoporosis. We know this. We've known this for thousands of years, right? That's when Hippocrates said, let food be thy medicine. So we had British sailors dying on the ships of scurvy. We threw some lemon and limes on their boats and we saved their lives with nutrients. That's how important nutrients are. So it's not just about calories, it's about the nutrients that we, we are eating. Now the next one is a loaded one. The perfect diet is a properly balanced diet. So we're gonna come back to that. But under the category of perfect diet, um, I just wanted to share with you that we have been trying for generations to find out what is the perfect diet for human beings. And so far we have not found one. However, one study I found was really interesting and that's called the blue zone uh, diet. And some of you may be familiar with this, but these are the five areas around the planet that has the highest concentration of centenarians. These are people that live to be over 100 years old. And they're not only living to be 100 years old, they are healthy at 104 years old. They are still sharp as a tack. They are still a part of the community. They are still getting physical exercise. And so those five areas around the globe, those blue zones, if you can't read it on the screen, it's California, Costa Rica, Italy, Greece, and Japan. And so now when we studied what did they eat to live to 100 years old, they all have different diets, okay? Some are vegetarian, some are, some have alcohol, some don't. But what common traits we did notice in those blue zones is that they did not eat any processed foods and any sugary treats, or most of the sugar treat, sugary treats that they had came from natural sugars, such as fruits. They all sat down and ate together and they took the time to digest their food properly together around the table. They ate fresh local produce and they ate what's in season. So we are not designed to have bananas and mangoes available to us 12 months out of the year. They only ate what was in season. And lastly, when they did have a treat, 
it was usually with a special occasion. And I'm talking about annual occasions like Christmas, not cakes in the kitchen three, three days of the week. So um, that's uh, what I wanted to share with you about um, a perfect diet. So there is no perfect diet, but we do want to have a properly balanced diet. Now, before I go into a properly balanced diet, there are four key food categories that really harm us. And I just want to review those four key food areas first, and then we'll go on to a properly balanced diet. Now, the first two have been all the rage and there's so much confusion and so much conflicting information about them. So I thought it was really important to share this information with you. And that is gluten and dairy. Now, I'm not going to make any friends here, but I'm going to say that gluten and dairy are not essential food groups. And we have been taught that they are and they really aren't. You know, we even have the phrase that my job is my bread and butter, you know, gluten and dairy. But really, that phrase should be my job is my fruit and veg. Fruit and veg is essential. Gluten and dairy are not. And I'll tell you why. So grains are a fairly new introduction to civilization since we started the agricultural society. And um, so therefore, from an evolutionary standpoint, we are not actually we haven't quite caught up yet in digesting gluten and grains. And so that is why some people don't necessarily uh, can't handle it as well as others. Also, the other thing is that the molecular structure of gluten is really closely related or really similar to the molecular structure of a really toxic pathogen. So it's really easy for our immune system to mistake gluten for a pathogen. And then our immune system responds and we end up with an intolerance. And so you can see how it can be really easy to actually have a gluten intolerance. There's other reasons as well, such as leaky gut, but um, that's, that's for another lecture. Um, so coming on to dairy, 75% of the world's population is lactose intolerant. Now I know that sounds like a really big number, but if you think about it, it's really not because from a genetic point of view, we are not designed to digest another animal's milk. In fact, I think we're the only species on the planet that digests another animal's milk. Now there is lactose in breast milk, um, however, our natural genetic um, makeup is that we lose that ability to digest lactose around the age, starting around the ages of three to five, and we slowly lose the ability to digest lactose because we don't need that ability anymore. We're, we're done breastfeeding, we're onto solid foods now. So that's why some people that weren't, didn't used to be dairy intolerant, lactose intolerant, can then become lactose intolerant because they've then lost that ability. In fact, if you can tolerate dairy, you actually have the mutated gene through the generations of, of having cow's milk and having dairy. Our genes have been um, mutated so that we can do it, um, but it is actually more natural to be lactose intolerant. Now, if we take a look at what cow's milk is, cow's milk is designed to make a 300 pound baby cow grow bigger and grow quickly. Okay, that cow's milk is full of sugars and growth hormones. And if the mama cow has been possibly been given antibiotics so she doesn't get sick. And if mama cow has had grains, then there's her, there's gonna be very few nutrients in that cow's milk as well. So you can see that we don't actually need those things that are in dairy. And then when we take that cow's milk and turn it into other dairy products, such as ice creams and yogurts and cheeses, um, then we're adding more preservatives and more sugar and more colorings to it. So you can really see that there isn't much in there that we need to survive. It's not essential. Now, I know what you're thinking, what about the calcium? Yes, there is a lot of calcium and calcium is very good for us, but we, we don't have to get it from dairy. There are other food sources that we can get it, such as your, your dark leafy greens, your spinach and your kales, your cruciferous vegetables, your broccoli and your cabbages. And I think even oranges, oh, beans as well. And oranges, I believe, have calcium in them as well. So we don't have to rely on dairy products for our calcium. Where some of the confusion comes into play nowadays is that the signs and symptoms of a gluten and dairy intolerance don't necessarily manifest as a digestive issue. And that's where it can get confusing. So I've listed some signs and symptoms there, headache, joint pain, mood issues, behavioral issues, and ADHD in children have been linked. Studies have shown they can be linked to gluten and dairy intolerances. Skin disorders such as eczema and asthma have been linked to dairy intolerances. So the whole range, everybody's body is gonna react differently to these intolerances. And um, so that is why they are not necessary in the diet. Now I'm not saying not, don't have them. If you are fine digesting them, have them. But I just wanted to give you this information so that you were aware one of what's going on and also just so that you're aware that we don't have to have them in our diet. So now the other two food categories that can really harm us, these ones are more common. These are our processed foods and our sugars. Uh, now I like to call processed food Frankenstein food because it looks like food, but it doesn't really have any nutrients. So it's not real food, is it? And a lot of times it can actually contain more chemicals and more sugars and additives and that than it does actual nutrients. Um, 
And if it's got more than five ingredients or it's got ingredients in it that you can't recognize, then I would suggest not buying it. Okay, so that's why I've got greater than five, don't buy. Um, just a quick little funny story. A couple of years ago, I had to uh, donate some fairy cakes, cupcakes for my daughter's school for a fundraising thing. And I was really busy at the time. So I thought, right, when do I need to buy them? If I have to bring them in Friday morning, do I need to buy them Friday morning? Can I buy them Thursday? Can I buy them Wednesday? So I went into the shop to have a look at the life um, the best before date of these fairy cupcakes. And I was shocked these cupcakes could last for a month. Now, if you make cupcakes at home, they're only gonna last a couple of days. So what was in these cupcakes that made it so that their taste didn't change, their texture didn't change, their color didn't change, their shape didn't change. Uh, it was still safe to eat. So I thought there must be more chemicals in this than there is actual natural ingredients. And needless to say, I never bought the cupcakes for the school. So that's, that's my story about processed foods. Moving on to sugars, all the rage of sugar is because sugar is our body's preferred fuel source. So yes, we can uh, use proteins and fats for fuel, but if there's sugar about, we prefer, our bodies prefer glucose for sugar. In fact, we are hardwired from an evolutionary point of view to crave it for survival. Our hardwiring um, lights up our, our, um, our satiety and our feel good hormones in our brain. And it also lights up our addiction centers in our brain as well to make us always seek out sugar. And that's because this comes from a time of scarcity, you know, so that if we came across a blueberry bush, we didn't just have two blueberries. We want to eat the whole blueberry bush because we don't know when we're going to find the next blueberry bush. But now we live in a time of plenty and sugar is everywhere, yet we still have this hard wiring to want sugar and to seek out sugar. But too much of a good thing leads to diseases. And that's what I've got there in red. And that's what we know about. The other thing I wanted to point out about sugar is that um, sugar is in foods that we don't always necessarily think about. Things like breads and pastas and rices, those carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are really just another form of sugar. It's just sugar molecules stacked together. And now normally in the, in the natural state, these um, items are brown, so brown rice. And the brown in that, the brown color in that is fiber. And fiber kind of acts as a slow release mechanism for the sugars in there. But when you strip it out of that brown, of that fiber and make brown rice turn white, then you've released, you've, you've taken away that slow release mechanism and then you're more likely to have a sugar spike. So that's why white rice and white bread will actually give you more of a sugar spike than brown rice and brown bread. So again, if it's white, don't bright. And I don't mean cauliflower, I mean things that can be brown. Okay, so now let's talk about the foods we should eat. So I think you recognize the plate on the uh, left. Plate on the left is the UK Eat Well plate. So that was brought to us in 2007, so 14 years ago. Um, and it was designed to say that if you eat these foods or when you eat these foods, this is the balance that you should be eating them in, right? So we've got chocolate in there, but only a little bit of chocolate. But now in the last 14 years, um, science, um, nutrition science has come a long way and we now realize that um, we can actually do, we can, we can remake that food plate to make it even healthier. And a lot of countries have started doing it. So the plate on the right is Canada's revised Eat Well plate. And so just a few po uh, points there, a few differences that I wanted to point out to you. So first of all, fruit and veg is now taking up half the plate. And you can see the, the fruit on the left is grapes, bananas, pineapples, and mangoes. They all have the most amount of sugar. Well, now that we know how damaging sugar is to us, we've put in berries, apples, pears, berries, and cherries. They are the fruits that have the least amount of sugar and the most amount of nutrients. So we wanna have half the plate of fruit and veg. We've still got our carbohydrates, but a smaller portion of it and more brown. And our proteins, the proteins on the left, as you can see, they're all animal-based proteins, which are good sources of protein, but they're all very, very inflammatory. Whereas plant-based sources of protein are very anti-inflammatory. So you can see we need to have a balance. So you can see on the right, we do have red meat and salmon and eggs and poultry, but it's also incorporated with some plant sources of protein, such as nuts and seeds and legumes and lentils and tofu in that. So um, the plate on the right is more saying that each one of your meals should have this balance. So you can see it doesn't have chocolate on it because we don't need chocolate to make our bodies function properly. We don't need dairy to make our bodies function properly. So that is more of a, this is what your plate should look like every day. Okay, coming on to the good stuff now. Now is the top tips. Now is the how to reduce and manage stress, encourage a good night's sleep, get active and use food to support our health. 
So now the reason I want to share these top tips with you is because it is so important because science is now showing that 80% of all chronic diseases can be prevented and even reversed simply through these four key areas of health, diet, exercise, sleep, and stress management. 80%, that's a huge amount. We can reverse heart disease. We can reverse diabetes now without medications, but or, or maybe alongside of medications perhaps, but through diet, exercise, sleep, and stress management. And that is why I feel it's so important to share these tips with you tonight. So top tips for supporting stress. So I think all of these things are not new to you for um, inducing relaxation. Stress is quite a big topic at the moment, especially through the pandemic. And so I think you know a lot of these things, but a couple I just wanted to point out of you, out to you. One of them is the deep breathing. So when, if you remember, when we're in a state of stress, we do that rapid shallow breathing. When we are resting and digesting, we tend to do deeper breathing. So simply by changing our breath, we can tell our body the danger is gone, we can rest and digest. We literally turn off the stress response by doing by taking deep breaths. And when your exhale is longer than your inhale as well, that also if you sort of breathe in for a count of four and then exhale for a count of seven, that also triggers your body to go from a stressful state to a relaxation straight state. And the good thing is we can do deep breathing anywhere, can't we? We can even incorporate it into our yoga practice and into our meditation practice. We do deep breaths before we fall asleep. So it's a really easy and simple tip that can really make a massive difference to the stress. And the last one I was just going to point out, someone at the bottom, that's hug time. That's not because I have three daughters and like the trolls movie. That is because when we hug and when we have that physical contact, the hormone oxytocin is released. And oxytocin is our all is safe in the world. I am loved. I am in a good place. All is well hormone. It's a big title for that, for that hormone. Now, normally we just associate oxytocin with mother and bonding's baby, mother and baby bonding. You know, you pick a baby up and when it's crying and it stops crying, that's because of the oxytocin. And when we hug, I think it's for about 10 seconds. After we're hugging for about 10 seconds, that's when the oxytocin floods our system. And again, it turns that stress system off. It turns the response off because oxytocin tells us that all is right in the world and we are okay. So now what foods should we be eating to support stress? So the first couple of things that we need to really focus on is to... Um, make sure that our blood sugar is balanced. I'm talking about blood sugar again. You can see a theme going here with the sugar. So now when we're in a state of stress, a lot of times we just go for the comfort foods, don't we? So let's say we have a donut or a bagel at breakfast and that spikes our blood sugar, but then we have a sugar crash and now it's 10 a.m. but we still have to get through the day. So we need something to pick ourselves back up. So we have maybe a chocolate bar. And then we just end up on this roller coaster of a sugar high and then a sugar low and a sugar high and a sugar low. And when we're already in a state of stress, that's just gonna add more stress. That's adding more fuel to the fire. We need to limit or eliminate caffeine. And again, because like I said, caffeine stimulates, it stimulates us by flooding our blood system with cortisol. And when we're already got high cortisol, that's gonna flood it even more. And if you remember, I said cortisol level is at its highest about 30 to 60 minutes after we wake up. And what are a lot of us doing 30, 30 to 60 minutes after we wake up? We're having coffee or tea, we're injecting caffeine. So if we were already at a, say a four out of 10 stress level, having a cup of coffee is just gonna shoot that right up to an eight out of 10 stress level. And again, we're working, we're working against ourselves here when we, we, when we have caffeine with under stress. Also alcohol is a form of stress too. It's a form of mental stress and it's a form of physical stress. It's a depressant, so it affects us men mentally and it's a poison so it affects us physically as well and again it's adding fuel to the fire when we're already in a stressful state. So what we can do to support a reduction in stress is we want to boost our serotonin levels naturally and we're going to talk about that when we get into the sleep. But just to give you some foods to support stress we want to look at magnesium. Magnesium is our calming nutrient so if that gets depleted um, when we're in a state of stress then our stress response is going to go up. The more magnesium we have, <coughs> the, excuse me, the easier it will be for us to be able to handle stress. We can't take away stress. Stress is all around us, but it can help us manage it better. And so there are some foods that are rich in magnesium. B vitamins. B vitamins are very good for modulating the nervous system, which is what our stress response is in. It's also good for very, um, very good for energy production. So if stress is really wearing you down and really fatiguing you, those B vitamins will help with energy production to help you get through that. And vitamin C, vitamin C is a key ingredient in order to make cortisol. So again, cortisol will steal that vitamin C away from say the immune system, which is already dampened because of stress. 
And because we are in a state of chronic stress, the vitamin C will get depleted. And so when, uh, when we have high stress, that vitamin C is going to, a decrease in vitamin C is going to affect us both um, psychologically and physiologically because it affects our mood as well. So we really need to make sure we have vitamin C rich foods when we're going in through a time of stress. Now, the reason that the B vitamins there are in red is only because those are double whammy foods. So the dark leafy greens are going to give you magnesium and they're going to give you B vitamins. Citrus fruits is going to give you B vitamins and vitamin C as well, because they're in both categories. So I thought they were worth highlighting in red. So now what do we need to support sleep? So we need to have tryptophan rich foods. So tryptophan is an amino acid that we cannot make in our body. We need to get it from food sources. And we need tryptophan to make serotonin, which is our feel good hormone. But serotonin is then changed and made and makes melatonin, which is our sleep hormone. So it's really important that we have the ingredients in order to make our sleep hormone melatonin. Exercise has been shown to support sleep. Now, if you're struggling with sleep, you want to make sure you're doing your exercise in the morning, because when we exercise, we get we flood ourselves with endorphins and that can actually keep us up. So we want to keep our, our exercise in the morning time. No electronic devices or screens one hour before bed. I think we know that one, that is because either one, what is on the screen is stimulating us or two, the light from the screens is simulating the same light as the sun and it's telling our cortisol levels to stay high and our melatonin levels to stay low and that's gonna stop us from sleeping. Uh, now, Kindles have been accepted. There have been um, loads of different sleep studies done that show that the light from a Kindle because it's side lit, not back lit, does not disrupt the circadian rhythm. So in the evenings, we wanna keep our lighting low um, because we're simulating the sun going down. We wanna have consistent bedtimes and wake up times with and allowing ourselves seven to nine hours of sleep time, not just seven to nine hours in bed. And we again, because we wanna make sure that we are really um, getting that circadian rhythm and balance. If we need to, we can even put in a relaxing bedtime routine, right? We do this with children, bath time, story time, bedtime, and we can do that as adults too. Let's let our body know that this is what is coming up next and what is coming up next is time to sleep. And this can help us relax as well, switch off from the day and get ready for sleep time. And some studies have been showing that 18 degrees is the optimum bedroom temperature for sleeping as well. So eating to support sleep, tryptophan rich foods, which I just mentioned. So there is a list of some tryptophan rich foods and other foods that have been shown to support sleep are kiwis, milk, right? Cup of warm milk before bed, nuts, oily fish and rice and boosting serotonin naturally, which I mentioned before. So things that do that is exercise. Um, getting vitamin D through your daylight. Uh, and I just want to talk to you about this for a minute because when we, when our body makes vitamin D from the daylight, it makes it in our skin. So the sun actually has to hit our skin in order to make vitamin D. So a lot of times we go and we feel it on our face or we see it on our eyes. We're not making vitamin D. It actually has to hit our skin and it actually has to hit quite a lot of our skin uh, in order to make vitamin D. And the rays of the sun actually have to be quite strong. So ideally what you wanna do is go out in that midday sun for about 10 or 15 minutes to really make a big load of vitamin D. But then of course, after that 10 or 15 minutes, you wanna put the sun cream on because we don't wanna burn, but we do wanna give ourselves just that 10 or 15 minutes in order to make some vitamin D. Now, the other thing I wanted to mention about making vitamin D is that because the sun's rays have to be quite strong in order for our body to make it, um, we cannot make it either in the early months. So when we had that gorgeous day in March, a couple of uh, a week or two ago, we weren't making any vitamin D. In October, if it's a nice sunny day, we're probably not making any vitamin D. And in the evenings, if it's a gorgeous sunny day and you're sitting out and you know, having dinner on your, in your back garden at 6.30 at night in July, if your shadow is longer than you, the sun's rays are no longer strong enough for you to make vitamin D. So you can always check if you're sitting out in the sun, whether or not you're making vitamin D is just stand up and see how long your shadow is. And that's a good indication of whether or not you're making vitamin D or not. So other ways to boost serotonin naturally is through massage therapy, right? So you can book your, book your massage in with the Total Therapy Studios. It'll help you reduce your stress and support your sleep. And positive thinking and happy thoughts, all right? That's when you, if you smile and laugh, it automatically makes you feel better and it automatically boosts our serotonin levels, right? So look at some old photographs, put on those happy tunes. Um, and yoga and deep breathing as well will also say all is right in the world, we can make serotonin. So a great day to support your sleep is get out in the morning and get your exercise, get your fresh 
um, get your fresh hair, get your vitamin D. So those two ladies in that picture aren't really making any vitamin D. So we need our skin a bit exposed, but they're happy. They're having happy thoughts. They're smiling. Then they're going to sit down and relax with a picnic. That's going to have maybe a turkey sandwich with some almonds and some bananas and some kiwis in it. They're going to enjoy the view and take some deep breaths and have a laugh and great day to set themselves up for some sleep. Okay. Right, moving on to exercise. So in forming an exercise routine, we wanna choose about two or three different exercises that you enjoy. Now doing two or three is gonna give you well-rounded fitness. So if you've got one that gets your heart rate going, one for your strength and maybe one for your flexibility and balance, that really ensures you've got well-rounded fitness and it keeps you staying interested, especially if maybe one is an outdoor activity and one is an indoor activity, but it's raining. So you can bounce, bounce back and forth between the two. And of course, if we're not doing the same thing day in and day out, it lowers our risk of injury as well. You can get active with a friend or a partner or a class, and that really helps keep you accountable because you don't want to let your friend down or you've paid for that class. And of course, it makes it more fun, doesn't it, when we're with other people. We can announce to friends and family that we're starting. Guys, guess what? I'm going to start running now. And of course, because they are your friends and they want to support you, they'll say, hey, Jackie, how's that running going? And I'm going to say, I only went once, didn't I? All right, because we, want, we don't want to let our friends down and we want to feel proud of our efforts. So we want to choose something that we want to do and we want to announce it to everyone. And of course, we want to make it a priority as well. You've got to get it in the diary. If it doesn't go in the diary, I promise you, life will get in the way. And the first thing that jumps out of our diary is, is our exercise, doesn't it? And it gets put on the back burner. If you allocate time for it, though, you're more likely to get exercise into your day. So foods we need to support exercise. So basically, in a nutshell, protein fuels our muscles and our growth and repair, and carbohydrates fuel our energy production. Now, ideally, you want to have these two in the same meal or snack, because protein, like fiber, acts as that slow release mechanism for the um, for the glucose in the carbohydrates. So you can have, let's say with that snack, you've got the apples with the nut butter. The nut butter will help um, slowly release the sugars out of the apples. And green apples have less sugar than red apples, by the way. And so look again, blood sugar balance, there it is. Um, the other way you can make sure you have a stable blood sugar, because if your blood sugar is not balanced, you could be, what if you have a sugar crash right before you're supposed to go and do your exercise? Or what if you have your sugar crash in the middle of your exercise, right? It's really important that your energy levels stay balanced with blood sugar balance. And the last way you can do that as well is by choosing low glycemic foods. So you can Google them in your own time of what low glycemic foods are which foods are low glycemic. But basically what it means is that these foods either have less sugar in them or they are slowly released into the system. They digest a little bit slower, which means the sugar is released a little bit slower. And that helps keep our blood sugar balanced as well. And of course we wanna drink one and a half to two liters of water today to keep ourselves hydrated while we exercise. So top tips for supporting nutrition. So we've all heard this one, we wanna eat the rainbow, don't we? And that's because the colors in the foods are made by different nutrients. So by eating the rainbow of foods, a rainbow of different color of foods, we are going to get different nutrients, which is gonna support different systems and functions in our body. As a, general, um, as a general reference, red foods are really good for our heart and our anti-cancer. Um, orange and yellow foods contain vitamin A, A for the rainbow there. And vitamin A is very good for um, our skin and our immune system. Green foods are really good for regulating our hunger and for hormone production. And blue and purple foods contain something called resveratrol, which is a really powerful antioxidant. And antioxidants protect our cells from damage. So, and because if our cells get damaged, then they don't function properly. And again, then we end up with imbalances. So we really wanna protect ourselves through those antioxidants. Now, currently we have the eat five a day. We all know to eat our five a day, but at the moment that could be eat five bananas a day. Where, whereas now, oh look, there's my Canadian food plate again. It's showing we need to fill half of our plate with veg. So we really should be having five vegetables plus two fruits a day. And that'll get us a really good balance and a really good variety of nutrients to support our body functioning properly. So we wanna eat whole foods in their natural state. We wanna reduce processed foods and sugars. We talked about that. We want to have protein, complex carbohydrates, those are your brown ones, and um, carbohydrates and vegetables. We want to have vegetables, healthy fats, such as olive oil and olives, uh, coconut in all forms, avocados, our nuts and our seeds and our oily fish. So whenever you're preparing your meals, just go through the checklist. Where's my protein? Where's my carbohydrates? Where's my healthy fats? Where's my vegetables? And if you've got all of those on your plate, you've got a really good healthy meal there in front of you. 
We also want to make sure we drink our water every day. And we can get that not through just plain water, but we can also get that through herbal teas. And, you know, for the people that don't like water, what about infusions? You know, put some um, cucumber in your water or raspberries in your water and make it a little bit more interesting. Hot water with lemon in the winter, perhaps. And by carrying a water bottle around with us at all times, that will help us drink our water as well. Speaking up, I'm going to have a sip of wine. Okay, we also want to limit dairy, which we talked about earlier and red meat as well. In those blue zones, a lot of the people only ate red meat quite rarely, so say two to three times a month. And that's because, now it is full of protein and full of iron, especially when it's organic. Um, however, it's really hard to digest. And so by reducing our red meat, it's giving our digestive system a break, and then we can incorporate some more plant-based proteins in there as well. And we wanna eat at regular meal times and avoid snacks. And that's just to help uh, keep our digestive system functioning properly, you know, so it can deal with lunch, it can deal with lunch, then it can deal with dinner, as opposed to it being a constant intake of food. And that's going to overburden our digestive system a bit. So right, now that we have all those top tips, let's talk about how we can incorporate them into our daily lives so that we can um, get the benefits from them. So like we talked about that negative effect at the beginning from lockdown where one negatively affects another one, we wanna get that reversing now, don't we? We wanna start making better food choices to reduce our stress, to get better sleep, get more active. So, excuse me, informing healthy habits. First, we wanna identify the goal and then we wanna make it smart. That's specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and in a timely manner as well. And this is one that I think the most important is identify your why. Why are you doing this? What's in it for you? Why is this important to you? And that's really your motivating factor. That's your driver for putting these habits into place. And how we can, um, how we can really uh, make that even more important is by visualizing two futures. So let's say you want to drop half a stone by the end of June. So if you envision yourself at the end of June and you're half a, you've reached your goal and you're a half a stone lighter, how are you going to feel? How is that going to impact your life? How is that going to impact the people around you? Now envision the future that you're exactly the same as you are and you did not reach your goal. How is that going to make you feel? And then we, of course, we want to, we want to do the, we want to go for the one that we reached our goal, didn't we? And so again, that's another driver to help you reach your goals. Excuse me. We need to identify blocks and challenges. Don't kid yourself. They are there. We need to address them in advance and plan for them so that they don't trip us up when, when we do come into play. Then next, we need to create our how. How are we gonna change our habits? And we're gonna come on to that in our next couple of slides. But basically we wanna make small manageable changes. And sometimes it can take a while to change a habit. So mini goals along the way will keep us motivated as well. So we wanna use small changes over a long period of time in order to create healthy habits. And I know a lot of times you think, well, that small change isn't gonna make a big difference. I've got this massive goal here and that small change is gonna do nothing over time it will. So imagine if a plane takes off the runway, if it's one degree off course, when it reaches its destination, is it gonna be one degree off course? No, it's gonna be hundreds of miles off course. In fact, it's not even gonna reach its destination, is it? Because it's gonna be hundreds of miles off course. That one degree over time can make a huge impact. So now these next two slides are brought to you by Atomic Habits by James Clear. This is a fantastic book and I highly recommend it. And it is all about making tiny changes to make re remarkable results. And so the information in the next few slides is completely taken from these books. And just to paraphrase really quickly, James says, make it, ob make it obvious. Okay, remove the negative triggers. If you want to reduce how much wine you're drinking, don't buy the wine. You want to reduce how much chocolate you're eating in the evenings, don't have the chocolate in the house. Design your environment so that it will obviously make your ha habit stick, right? You can't eat the chocolate if it's not there make it attractive. So we need to reframe our mindset and we remember our why. Why are we doing this, right? What is that attractiveness to, to pull us to the end? And it's not that I don't get to eat chocolate. It's that I get to fuel my body with the things it needs to do the exercise so I can reach my goal. And so we need to remember our why and make it, a, a, think about it in the positive mindset. And James also talks about doing something motivational bundling. So that's when you want to put the habit that you're trying to form next to something that you do that you already really enjoy. So let's say you love your morning ritual of having your cup of tea in the morning, but you're trying to drink more water. So what you could do is say, before you have your cup of tea, you've got to drink one glass of water. So by putting the two together, you're almost getting rewarded for drinking water because you get that cup of tea at the end. And that helps you stick to those habits because you put something that you enjoy right next to it. 
then we want to make it easy, right? We don't want to make this any harder than it already has to be. So we want to make those small changes. And James Clear even talks about gateway habits, which he said are little habits that only take two minutes. So let's say your habit that you want to change is to exercise more. Your gateway habit would be take your workout clothes out the night before and put them on your bed. Put your trainers next to the front door so you're ready to go. These little habits that really support your bigger habit. And that will help automate it as well and automate where possible. So a perfect example of this is doing your online grocery shopping, right? Why walk down the aisles of the grocery store where you're seeing the crisps and the chocolate and the wine when you're online shopping, it's not there, out of sight, out of mind, and it makes it easier for you. And the last thing he says is make it satisfying. Award your, reward yourself for all of your efforts. And that tells our brain that, hey, when we do this habit, we get rewarded. So I'm gonna keep doing that habit. And so that could be something like every time you do a workout, put two pounds in a jar so that you can buy your next pair of skinny jeans or put marbles in a jar. And when you have 25 marbles, you get a prize or you get a reward of some sort. And the last thing he says is track your habits. So I've used the Way of Life app on my phone and you just put in uh, what your habit is you're trying to make. So let's say it's exercise. And at the end of the day, if I've done my exercise, I get a nice big green tick. And if I haven't done my exercise, I get a big red X. And it's really amazing how much you want that green tick and how much you don't want that red X because this app tracks your progress. So that red X is in there, right? It goes into all the graphs and charts that it makes for you over time. So it's actually a lot more motivating than it sounds, but uh, you really go for those green ticks. Right, so those are my tips for supporting healthy habits. So if with, with your permission, I'd just like to take, just, I know we're running out of time, but I just want to take a couple of minutes to talk to you about nutritional therapy and how it can support you. So nutrition science is the study of how nutrients, foods, and lifestyle factors influence the functioning of our body. It looks at, you know, how each nutrient affects different aspects of our body as well. And what nutritional therapy does is we assess the whole person as an individual, how each system is working within that individual, its family history, what you eat, you know, what happened to you, your illnesses that you had as a child. We look at the whole picture of you and then we apply nutrition science to identify the key areas of imbalance that's happening that may be causing the symptoms, addressing the root cause. And then we apply nutrition science again to put together a personalized nutrition and lifestyle plan to, for exactly what you need at this moment to help you improve your health. Now, one of the roadblocks I tend to get quite a bit is, oh, but I have bad genes, there's nothing I can do. Now that's right, but only to a certain extent, right? So the DNA you were born with is the DNA you're gonna die with. It is never gonna change. There is nothing you can do about it. That is correct. However, science has now found that genes can be switched on or switched off, dialed up or dialed down, right? So just because you have the BRCA gene doesn't guarantee that you're going to get um, a female cancer or um, so it just increases your vulnerability to getting it. So if anything, if you've got that increased vulnerability, you've got an increased need. You even need even more to bathe your genes in an environment, a positive environment with diet and lifestyle to help keep those genes dialed down. So I like to say that genetics loads the gun, but it's the environment that pulls the trigger. So you are in control of your health to a certain extent, even if you have a genetic a family history. So let's say you have arthritis, right? We may not be able to take the arthritis away, but maybe nutritional therapy can take the pain from an eight out of 10 down to a three out of 10. Now that's gonna have a huge positive impact on your life. Or maybe you've got heart disease and heart disease may still get you in the end, but maybe by bathing those genes in a positive environment, you may get 20 more years of life before heart disease gets you. So again, yes, genes are there, but if anything, we should um, do more when we have our bad genes. Um, just uh, quickly, just to give you a perfect example of myself. So if you look at my DNA, because I've had my DNA tested, I am lactose intolerant and, I have, and I've got the celiac gene. Now, I am not actually lactose intolerant. My lactose intolerant gene is not switched on. I can handle dairy. I don't tend to eat it very much, but it doesn't upset me at all. Now, my celiac gene, again, I was fine. I can handle gluten, no problem. And then in my early 40s, that gluten gene got turned up a little bit and I started reacting negatively to gluten. So what did I do? I bathed my genes in a positive environment. I healed my gut. And now I can have a little bit of gluten from time to time. I've got a small tolerance for it. And hands up, I had um, hot cross buns over Easter, but I know I can only have a little bit of it. Otherwise, I will start getting the intolerant symptoms. So we can have a little bit of control, even when we've got bad genes. So the last slide, what's in it for you guys? So how does nutritional therapy support you? Well, we address the root cause 
right? When we have a headache, we don't automatically assume we have a brain tumor. Just because the pain is there doesn't mean that's what's causing, that's where the problem is. We know a headache can be caused by dehydration or stress or lack of sleep or lack of magnesium, magnesium or hormone imbalance. So we look at addressing the root cause. We heal your body naturally, right? No side effects with nutritional therapy. And because I use nutrition science and because I do that deep analysis of you, I give you very clear direction and a personalized nutrition plan. I take all of the guesswork out of it. You know, if you're struggling with something, you know, and you're, how much exercise should I do? What if I'm eating too many carbs? I take all of that away and I give you a clear direction. And we can use small manageable changes to make sure that um, our changes last. Now, having said that too, we can personalize your rate of progress. So I've had clients come to me and say, right, you just tell me what to do. I'll do it all. I just want this to go away. And they do, they go and do it all. But of course, there's other clients that say, look, I've really got a lot of plate on my life in my life right now. I can really only handle those two changes. Fine, no problem. Let's work with those two changes. And then when you're ready, we'll implement, we'll incorporate some more changes for you to help you reach your goals. The other, thing we, the other thing I can do is I can also um, implement health coaching techniques if that's needed. So that's when people are feeling like, well, I know exactly what I need to do. I just can't seem to make myself do it. Or I can start something, but then I end up self-sabotaging. I don't know why I do that to myself. That's when we can implement health coaching techniques to help you get through those hurdles as well. And the last one, I say the last, the best one for last, this is the one that uh, really inspires me. And that is that you get overall health and well-being in all areas. So for example, let's say someone comes to me with their constipation, right? So we address the gut, we heal the gut. They come back to me and they say, my constipation is gone, but guess what? I'm also sleeping better. And I've got my brain fog is gone and I've got more energy and my skin is glowing. It's almost like benefits because again, you get that positive spiral. The techniques we use to heal our gut has a positive knock-on effect with other areas with her sleeping with her um, cognition and um, then you can really get a lot of extra benefits as well that can really impact your life okay guys that's the end of my presentation so thank you so much for joining me this evening um, now if you're interested in finding more out about nutritional therapy i do offer a free 15 minute call so you can just call the studio um, and book me in and then you and i can chat personally about how nutritional therapy can support you um, and again, I want to just thank you for spending your time, your, your relaxation time this evening with me. And as a thank you, I'd just like to give you a free gift. I've put together an immune boosting recipe ebook in a PDF form that we will send out to you in the next day or so. Again, as a thank you for joining me tonight. Okay, right. So I think, I think we may have run a few minutes over. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. And I'm just going to try and just see if there's any questions in the chat box. We'll quickly go through those. Oh, we should have so interesting. Thank you very much. Uh, that was from Fiona. Thank you, Fiona. And Christine, thank you for comment. She says that's really informative and thank you. If you think of any questions later on, you can always email me. I have my email on that last page. And if there's any questions, please do feel free to drop me a line and I'm happy to answer any questions that you guys may have. Wave beats me.